I think we're gonna get started now. Um, today we are very honored to have three USF faculty members coming here to show us how they begin to start developing a syllabus for online courses. As you know, syllabus is the, the structure of how you're gonna guide your students throughout the learning um, period. And because it's online courses, a lot of the tips and tricks that you might be considered that is different than when you design a syllabus for your face-to-face -face class. So today we have Susanna from the Humanity English Department, we have Memphim from the uh, Finance Department, and we have Nihiraka, who, who's going to be her short, and she has a class. She's from the uh, Sociology Department. And, and I have witnessed how much they prepare for their course, and their syllabus looks pretty good. So we're today, because we have three presenters, so the, the format of the event is a little bit different. We're going to start first having Susanna present 10 minutes of the quick overview, how, how her uh, thought process, her logic, when, we, when she designed it. And then we'll have a Niharaka as the second one for another 10 minutes, and Nathan will be the third person, you know, present her 10 minutes about the overview. Then we're going to have the next 10 minutes for three of them at the stage, just kind of more like a panel discussion kind of thing to talk about uh, tips and tricks, what they think it will be good to provide to the audience. And finally, we will open for Q&A. So before we begin, does anyone have any questions or anything? If not, we'll start have Susanna presenting her um, experience designing a course syllabus for online students. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was a little bit amused when Megan asked me to speak today because um, I'm not exactly what you would call an expert. I've done this once. There is obviously some need for online classes, and um, the administration is putting some pressure on us in English and humanities to develop more such classes. So I wanted to try this format, even though I have to admit that I'm not completely sold on online teaching. I love being in the classroom. And so in order to prepare, I attended the lunchtime meetings that Megan's office was offering, and I even became a member of a faculty learning community. I'm happy to announce that this semester I'm leading one on online education. Apparently, you know, once you've done it once, you become a leader. <laughs> and, um, you know, I also realized that despite my hesitations, there was really a lot of support and a lot of assistance from the distance education staff. So at least I didn't feel lost or alone as I was venturing into this. Um, I thought since the university does not give me, when I make up an online class from an already existing class, and when the class already has been taught by others in online format, um, there's really no financial or time really support, right? So I figured that's going to be really easy. They're not giving me support. I'll just convert my class. So I looked at my old syllabus. And you can tell even at a distance that it looks quite playful with pictures and using Joe Palladino's suggestion. Um, he used to teach psychology here. Some of you may not even remember him. Um, I left a little space so the students could fill in their grades um, because I'm really not very good about keeping the Blackboard online gradebook. I'm a little lazy about that. And, you know, I don't want my syllabus generally to be too legalistic. So I spell out the rules, but I'm not terribly detailed about it. So I studied my old syllabus as a kind of planning tool. And then this thing grew on me. I realized that what I thought would be a matter of, oh, we'll just change this up and it'll become an online class. It became more and more involved. Um, when done correctly, even if you're not getting any kind of support from your department, uh, this could be rather an involved process. But it may not necessarily be a bad thing. I looked at the catalog description for this course, and I really resort my course objectives. Um, you know, in, in a humanities survey course, whether you teach the first or the second half, you cover about, um, well, between two and 3,000 years in the first half and about 500 years in the second half. So there's a lot to do. And you want the students to have some kind of acquaintance 
preferably a deeper one rather than a more superficial one, with the major figures, the major events, what all went on and how it all connects. And in Humanities 211 and 212, there should be some exposure to painting, to music, to literature. Um, so it's a smorgasbord of things that you want to do, and there's a lot of classroom interaction. Even though we teach some mega classes now, the ideal humanities class is one where you know all of your students and where there is a constant give and take. So while it's exhausting for the instructor and really an exercise in humility because you always learn so much while you're teaching the class, uh, you, you take away a lot too because if the students really do get involved, it's an enriching class. So, you know, as I was planning, I reconsidered, and that's, I think, where the exercise was a really good one. What I really love about teaching humanities, I like the interactions with my students, and I like our discussions when I finally get them going. And we do build some good relationships in the classroom, and although I cannot claim that all 35 students will display intellectual growth, some do, and that's the fun part. So as I was working with Megan and with Laura, I was trying to figure out ways in which I could convert all of that into an online setting. And here, I guess, you know, that's part of my philosophy, that I don't want to give up what I love in the actual classroom. I've had a conversation with Jason Ferdig recently. He teaches business classes, and he embraces another philosophy. He thinks that the online environment is a totally different one and that you simply have to abandon your beliefs about classroom interactions to make the online environment work mainly for the students. I guess I'm not quite ready to go that path. Maybe I will eventually, I have no idea. Um, so I was interested as I was making the transfer to offer a lot of interactive uh, blackboard type uh, activities such as discussion boards, um, I use the chat tool, although it, it clearly has its limitations. My students seem to like the blog spot a lot. In order to get some kind of visual interaction, even though in an asynchronous environment, I try voice thread. Initially, I thought I would use Panopto, but uh, both Laura and Megan really like voice thread, so I tried that. And I think it works quite nicely, because at least visually, if everybody loads an image, you get the impression of sitting around a table and the students can always leave comments after you record a lecture too. And then I was really interested in the synchronous activities such as Blackboard Collaborate. But I think next summer I do want to try some other means such as GoToMeetings. And now I have learned there's an Adobe version of such uh, a technology as well, because Blackboard Collaborate had its drawbacks. The video didn't always work right, and then we had to click on and click off the audio. So the conversations were halting, but I think as the technology improves, I will get more of that classroom feel that I like. Um, it was important, and I realized that more and more, that in addition to finishing the syllabus as a complete product early, so that you can actually give it to students and they know what to expect. It's also good to reach out in, in a letter early so that they know that your class is one that does involve interactions at certain times. And it may be possible in the future of coding our online classes in such a way that students will know that perhaps once a week at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays, maybe, there might be an interactive activity. So if they don't want that, they can simply enroll in another section of a class. So I like that idea because I, you know, I had to offer alternatives to the interactive activities because if students are not aware that this is what they're registering for, you can't very well force them to participate. But I do like the idea of getting them to a point where they have the technology and the time commitment of meeting me online uh, at least once a week. I also learned that you really cannot have a terribly playful syllabus. It has to be structured. And if it's color coded, it's even better. Um, Megan pointed that out to me. You know, I was just going to throw everything I had in my <laughs> syllabus into a table, 
but you really have to be specific about your expectations, the activities that occur on every day or should be occurring, and when everything is due. And I think I've learned a lot for my uh, traditional classes about syllabus design. As it turns out, I've talked with my freshmen, my traditional freshmen about this, and they seem to want this kind of syllabus even for a traditional class. So, you know, that was great news to me, uh, but I'm learning. And I also learned from Laura that one should have pretty good rubrics for everything that is done online because you will not meet the students to be able to explain to them where they have missed points or how they will be graded. So if all of this is prepared beforehand, then they will know what is expected of them. And if there are questions about grades, you can always point to your rubric and say, well, you only showed up once for VoiceThread where we expected perhaps three postings. Uh, for this particular day, or you, you know, you made a one-sentence posting when we were looking for detail, or you should have really referenced the readings while you were talking, uh, and you did not. This is how you were graded. So it definitely helps to streamline the syllabus if you attach rubrics early on. So you know, to conclude my experience, um, it was labor-intensive. It proved to be beneficial to my teaching. I think because it forced me to reflect on what I really want to get out of a class and how I want to get there. And so I have to say that the beneficial effects weren't just for this one online class that I have taught now and will repeat this coming summer, but for my teaching experience as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna, for You're your very welcome. The second um, pre faculty presenter is Niharaka, and she is actually going to present her syllabus through the Blackboard Structured, because she believes that um, Blackboard is the place, the central place for you to draw students' uh, attention on that. So she not only has a copy of a paper syllabus, but at the same time, the components and the syllabus, she is like uh, um, specially designed it to put it in different locations on the uh, Blackboard course site so it can remind students all the, all the uh, guidelines and, and stuff. So we're going to let her go ahead to start her presentation. Thank you so much, Megan. Okay, so... Um Thanks, Megan, for that. And as Megan said, that I'm going to talk about the syllabus today. Um, as I, you know, I developed that with the help of uh, Megan. Thank you very much. And then that was actually the first time that I taught a fully online course in the summer of this year. And prior to that, I had taught um, a hybrid course, which was partly online and partly offline. Um, and that kind of helped me to get into that online mode because I was one of those people who was very skeptical about doing it online and uh, I thought let me test the waters with the hybrid and then I'll see <laughs> okay uh, but of course you know I'm really happy that I did it and um, I will be teaching several online courses I mean uh, of introduction to <coughs> sociology in 2014 um, and the course that I have developed for the online is uh, the principles of sociology SOCH 121 and the reason that I picked this is because um, you know this is when I teach it offline I teach it to anywhere between 200 to 275 students in a large lecture forum uh, you know in a large lecture theater. And I was thinking that this would be one of those introductory courses that would be great to try to teach online. It's an introductory course. I mean, I'm still not there where I can <coughs> envisage myself teaching a seminar course online, but I'll be there one day too, I think. But right now I'm sticking to the introductory course, which I feel um, is has a, has a very good structure to make it an online course, and you know these introductory courses are also taken by people who are not necessarily in Evansville. Soch 121 is needed for several students, so it's also a good way to have students uh, take this course, and uh, it's good for USI too. Um, so I did develop a syllabus, but then the entire syllabus is there, obviously, 
but the syllabus is also broken down into these various sections because we know that students often do not check the syllabus and in an online course what I learned is that we have to have everything broken down in parts and in details and um, so that's what I did and I'm going to go through it bit by bit but the first thing that I have that I had is a welcome um, to my class kind of um, you know um, uh, spiel and this is also what what the text that you see here you know this course will introduce you to the field of sociology and so on that is also there in the syllabus so I kind of took the you know used the uh, text that is there in the syllabus to put it in a welcome box here as if I'm talking to students and just so that you know that um, I made a little video of myself in my office reading this out so that people are not just reading the text and they kind of this is my first interaction with them where they see me that I'm a real person sitting in my office and uh, you know reading out a welcome to the class and what this course will contain um, and then um, you know the next section about this course is where I had of course a syllabus right there but then I also had this um, thing called course requirements again which is there in the syllabus and the course requirements contained the required text and very important the required technology and this is something that you know Megan um, you know taught me and helped me to formulate that what are the things that students need in order to be able to participate in that course and one of the things that I learned from Megan is that please note required what is compatible or not compatible should be in bold so things that we want to them you know want to pop out for them to catch immediately um, should be in those bold so some kind of color coding um, is, is needed to um, you know to, to um, communicate these instructions to them and then this was a very useful link check your internet connection speed okay because these are some things that really um, often do not um, you know come in the way of uh, connection and the kind of webcam that is needed and so on and then of course last but not the least for more information about the technical requirements please visit the distance learning office if there is anything needed so required technology again this is something that is there in the syllabus but I will assume that students will never look at the syllabus and they will go through this step by step and then they will go through everything that I want them to do now if we go back to the course requirement um, sorry if we go back here we see in the same about this course we have also course information and grading methods um, so there is a you know a block called online exams and what is you know what I found very useful for the online exams is the best practices for taking an online exam because again one of the things that I learned from Megan and actually Walter helped me a lot with this as well if you remember Walter because <laughs> so, so because because one of the things that I saw is that um, and this is during the hybrid when I was teaching the hybrid is that sometimes the internet connectivity would go off the students would say that even when they are on campus so these are little things and then you would get an email saying oh I've been shut off so now I uh, please reconnect me to the exam and so on so anticipating all of this you know we have to tell them use a wired connection close all open programs they may have iTunes on we cannot monitor that if they have iTunes on while we are taking you know while they're taking the t exam open programs may interfere choose all close all background programs that connect to the internet um, if you're on a home network try taking your exam at a time when others are lightly, lightly using your network um, you know so that to re release the pressure on the internet as much as possible that you when you you know as you take the exam you keep track of your answers outside of blackboard so in case your uh, connection is lost you have the answers click the save button every 10 minutes or so I'm not going to you know go through all of these in details but these are some of the best practices that they are not foolproof 
But if we know that the students have followed all of these, and then if something happens, then I will activate the exam. But if the students are not following any of these, you know, and then just takes it, I may decide whether I want to activate, reactivate the exam or not. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, other than that, I also had in the course information the um, assignments. And um, again, um, this is you know, relating to my course, what I want the assignment to be. And then, of course, the voice thread discussions. This is something that, um, you know, I used for the first time in the summer of this year. And I loved it. I mean, I loved it because I think it allowed me to see the students and the students to see each other. Um, but having said that, there were some, you know, kinks that I found with the voice thread discussions, which, you know, I'm in a discussion with uh, Laura and Megan that we will fix that when I'm going into um, the spring to teach the online course. Um, but then this is, I think, a great, great tool for um, for really generating some interaction between the students, which is very interesting because in the offline class, I mean, since it's a large lecture theater, in the offline class, I don't have much interaction because um, I teach, like I said, anywhere between 200 and 275. The only way that I have the interaction a little bit is I use the response clicker system. And the clickers help me to interact a little bit. So I was thinking what would be a way to make them interact here and the voice thread helps them talk to each other which actually the large class does not so that was a bonus definitely here and then my grading schema um, communication with me I had a little online office hours where I gave them a Skype ID which I specially created for them and they friended me and then um, that would allow some um, you know online office hours um, and then, of course, the check grades um, box, online course evaluations for me, and then the check grades box where they could go and check their grades anytime they wanted to. Um, then this is, I think, one of the most important part of the course is what we, what I had is the weekly schedule. And, you know, this was a summer course, so there were five weeks, and Beside each week, I had the dates, and all they had to do was click for each week, and then there would be a serially, the discussions, the things that they were had to do for every week. Very detailed, no room for any ambiguity. You have to go one by one by one by one. So watch the lecture recordings. Now, these lecture recordings I recorded using the Penopto. Um, so they are lecture recordings from my offline class that I recorded in the Penopto. And then what I did is I uploaded those for the class. And then I also had um, you know, PowerPoints that they could follow along while they were listening to the recordings. So again, very detailed. I, I think the details are the key and the tips and tricks to the online class. Watch lecture recordings, um, this PowerPoint, accompanies the lecture recordings, you know, then I have to also tell them that just listening to the lecture recordings is not enough. You have to also have to read the textbook, right? <laughs> so I even laid that out. You will need to read chapter one from the textbook after they have gone through all of this, not assuming that they will read it by themselves. Then there is a study guide. After they have done all that, we will have a voice thread discussion where they will post a comment to a question that I have on the voice thread discussion. And then they will not just answer to me, I mean, answer my question, but also comment on somebody else's answer. So there were two layers to, to the voice thread discussion. And then the exam. So week two is like that as well. And this is how it goes, week three, week four, week five. Now, all of this, of course, has to be laid out before the course begins. So that when I'm in week one, I feel I want to say, change something in week two. I don't do that because some people go ahead. And if there is a little change in an online class, it can be very unsettling, both for the students and for me. Um, then, of course, the assignments. 
um, you know, which are, which are also included in that weekly schedule, uh, but there is also a separate tab in case somebody wants to look at it. But these are all tied to the weekly schedules as well. Well, they have to le read a blog post and then write an answer. Then, of course, we have the voice thread discussion. Again, I have a separate tab here. But if anybody, nobody were to open the assignments voice thread online exam at all and just look at the weekly schedule, they would still have everything there. That's the trick. So this is just to give an extra, you know, if somebody wants to go through this detail by DVD. But if I were to block out all of these off, the weekly schedule would be enough for them to go through all of that. Um, and then, of course, the online exam. And then another thing that I learned from Megan is repeat the instructions in several places. So that students come across the instructions um, in several places of these places, whether it be about this course. So this link, for example, is tied to in a little folder in about this course as well. So they come across it again and again. And then check grades, um, and then send emails, and Blackboard help. So, um, so yeah, that is, that is my little um, spiel on how to organize the syllabus and and the course and like i said that and and like i said that the trick is really in the details in in having all the tasks and all the details down um, so that there is no room for interpretation and ambiguity anywhere it is 1 2 3 4 black and white I mean, not, of course, the subject matter. Sociology is far from black and white. <laughs> in terms of, you know, the tasks that they have to do and the instructions that they have and the expectation that I have of them and so on. I mean, let me tell you that there are going to be technological hitches. Um, the trick is to know, you know, I mean, we have a wonderful office. So whenever we have something, they're always there to help us. And, you know, as we learn, as we move along, the things that we feel didn't work for us, like I said, there were certain things in VoiceThread that I felt needs to be worked out. We, we will do that next time to see that it's figured out. So, you know, there are things also that we are figuring out for each of our courses as we are going along because, um, you know, we are, we are kind of using these technologies to meet the goals of the course that we have. So, um, thank you very much. That was an excellent demonstration of how to prepare your online students to have their learning success by having everything laid out, not only just on the paper syllabus, but at the same time how you structure your course, and that was excellent. So now we have Mei Fen from um, the finance department is going to show us how she designed her syllabus. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, a lot of things that I was going to say, uh, they already covered. It is a good thing to be the last presenter, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, this is my course syllabus. I started uh, teaching online in fall 2009 when there were not many online courses de developed during that time. Um, Basically, what I did was I read several articles and talked about what are the components necessary, including in your course syllabus. Also, I, you know, check online, uh, look at others' course syllabus, and then I create my own. So since 2009, this is what I have. The very first paragraph, I told students the course syllabus is the contract between students and me. And then I told them, you know, in the course syllabus, there are rules, requirements, expectations. And then if they do so, in return, I will, based on the specifications I have in my course syllabus, I assign grades to them. So they earn the grades. I'm not giving grades. I assign grades based on their performance. There are several key components I want to just briefly talk about. Um, I think the most important thing when I design my course syllabus is communication. Since I don't see them, 
my course is pure online. I don't see my students unless they come to my office to ask me questions. But majority time, they use email. So what I do is I keep in mind I need to communicate with my students. Everything has to be in details. So um, my course syllabus is 12, 13 pages long. You can tell that. So I, I do have uh, the minimum hardware requirement and the software requirement. I use a lockdown browser for them to take online test. So I told them where to download, how to download, and what are the documents they need. I want to talk about course organization. And um, this is the most important part for our students because they need to follow how to study, how to become successful. So the last page of my course syllabus, I show them, oh, sorry. I show them each week I have a module. And then when, you know, uh, for each week they need to study what module and when the exams will be. And then on my blackboard, it is organized in terms of modules. So let me come back to the course design. Here I told them that it's based on module. And then each module, when they open that module, each module, the first, step, first item is study procedure. So when they open that document, it tells them, first of all, you need to read these pages. Secondly, you need to do this, and third, and so on. So I gave them the guideline. They have to follow. It is by module. Each module has one document. And then with, within each module, the last item will be quiz. So here, I told them how you prepare this class. So you start with a preview. You need to read the suggested pages from the study procedure. So I told them which pages you need to study. And then you enter virtual lecture. You view and listen PowerPoint slide with narration together with lecture notes. So what I do is I create a Word document. I call it a lecture notes related to the material I'm going to cover. And then I use PowerPoint slide. I use Breeze Presenter back then, 2009. That's, that's the software recommended to us. So I record my lecture. And then when students use the lecture notes, they have a problem printed there, but there's no answer, no exp explanation, and so on. But everything is on PowerPoint slides. I record my explanation. They take, they take notes as if they were in the traditional classroom. So it's like they are taking uh, the class. So they write the notes, you know, listen to the lecture, and their, their conceptual questions, it's hard for you to type the explanation. So I explain to them. Once they've done that, and then they enter into what I call review, they go over chapter review and the self-test problems as suggested in study procedure. So in the study procedure, I told them what problems they need to go over, what review questions they need to go over. Another section is critical thinking and a concept of review. So they need to follow that, finish all the review, and then they get to homework part. I use a software called Connect, even though it costs student money. But since they are away from me, I really could not see whether they know or not. So I have to force them to buy the code and work on all the homework problems. And if they are not successful, my recommendation is they go back and repeat the process. You know, go back. Maybe you didn't read the book. You thought you knew the material. Go back and read the pages and go back and listen to the lecture and then go back to your homework. So that's how I design uh, the course organization. And uh, here, I think every, they all covered that. I told them you know, um, how you navigate the course website, how you um, join the um, chat room, you know, things like that. Um, I want to talk about another thing is, like I said, communication is very important. At the end of my course syllabus, it shows weekly which module you need to study. I also provide what I call quiz and exam schedule. Um, here I have each week I have a chapter quiz, and then I told them how many questions, how many hours, how, how much time they have, and when the quiz is available, when the quiz is ends, and then how many times you have access. The first week, because we are testing the software, so I gave them unlimited time to access the quiz. From then on, 
they have only two uh, period of time to access the quiz. I don't want to give quiz the entire week because I don't want a student look at a quiz question, study, and then at the end of a week to take that quiz again. So I only give them two days period, period, and then, you know, if they fail, study more next day to take it. So basically that's my idea. Uh, one trick is when you design this, you have to have certain pattern. You don't want to have a quiz due Monday and next week quiz due Wednesday, you know, here and there. Try to keep it in a pattern so they know Thursday, Friday, more than likely, I'm going to have quiz. For a more complicated chapter, I give them more time, so their quiz will be Monday and Tuesday. And here I talk about the uh, homework. Homework is due the same day as quiz, but I recommend them to finish homework before they take a quiz. So everything has to spell out, has to be, you know, very clear. My course syllabus has 12 to 13 pages. I know it's long, and I don't expect students to read everything, but I send a course syllabus about three, four weeks before the school starts. And then I communicate to them, uh, communicate to them with announcements. Every time, like beginning of semester or regarding the technical issue, I will have an announcement on the week one, week one. I give the contact information of distance learning department, connect department, also Blackboard. And then when they started working on homework, I send another email. So I have multiple emails throughout the semester. They are related to the course syllabus, what we just talked about. So reinforce what you have in course syllabus, even though they might, don't, they might not remember. So that's what I want to present to give you the highlight. I don't want to repeat what they have already presented. Thank you. earlier, now is really uh, all the three presenters will get together at this front row, so we're going to turn to a panel discussion session, and three of them will actually if spend like five minutes, just give the top three tips that they think will be helpful to, um, to the audience, and they will open for questions. So the presenters, please um, have a seat. And then we can take turn that you think of top three things that's the most important thing that you will recommend your faculty colleagues to be mindful of when designing a system. So maybe Susanna can start first. Well, it's kind of repeating what Linton just said. You really have to be organized. You have to know what you want to get out of the class, what you want the students to get out of the class, and how we're going to get to that final outcome. So, like. Like I said, you need to really have the product finished. I was finishing up while I already started teaching my summer class because I didn't realize how organized I would have to be, and I'm not generally that organized. But it really forced me to to think of this finished product and have it done. And then the third point, as I think we all said, you have to be very detailed and very specific about everything and anticipate in what my students like to call reverse psychology, what all can go wrong, because it will go wrong, inevitably. And there will be something you never even thought of that can go wrong too, or can be misunderstood. It's quite bewildering. <coughs> even while you're thinking you're totally clear, it will be misunderstood somehow. Yeah, I think you, you pretty much said it. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say anything different. I mean, organization, detail, and anticipation what can go wrong and, and, and be prepared to fix it when it goes wrong with the help of the and, and, and I would say when it goes wrong, not to panic because if something goes wrong, um, the distance learning office is there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so we can turn to them, yes. Um, I think um, Megan's office has done a great job helping us. Um, I, I just remember in 2009 when I started, um, every Friday night I was thinking in my head, uh, trying to record, trying to get my course ready to post that night. But now we, we get a lot of help here. 
One thing I want to point out in addition to what we just talked about is refining emails. Mm -hmm. Students tend to panic. I give you a quick example. I had a one non-traditional student who had a accounting uh, degree came back to take a finance 305. And then she sent me email all the time. I reply Sunday, Saturday, even though in my course of syllabus, I said within 48 hours I would reply email. But I try my best to reply immediately. So I did a Saturday, Sunday. And all of a sudden, this one day, she sent an email. I was busy with the faculty chair stuff. I didn't have time that day. I got a lot of stuff I need to do. So I decided, plus, when she asked me questions, she forgot to tell me which question she was asking me. I had to really dig all the homework and find that. I didn't have time, so I wait uh, about a day and a half. And then she, she was upset, and she sent an email to my boss. And then said, you know, I didn't reply email, I was not helpful, and so on. Then my boss sent an email forward to me and say, you know, you need an interest student. I went back, here's the thing, you need to be organized. You need to keep all the records. I'm very good at that. I keep all my records. So I be able to reply email, say, I say, on this day, which is Monday or Wednesday, and so on, on this day, I reply email. On Saturday, this day, I reply. Sunday, this day, I reply. So keep a good record. Check your email print, uh, frequently. I don't blame all students. When you panic, you have homework due. You, you want to get a response. But, you know, th there has to be reasonable. Another way you can do is tell the students, I will check email in the morning, 10 o'clock, in the afternoon, 3 o'clock, during the evening, 6 o'clock. So if they send you email 5 o'clock, you already said you are not going to have time to check email until 10. So they won't check email all the time, trying to see whether you respond. So that's just my Very good comment. So now we're open for questions. The, the Smarter Measure uh, online readiness assessment is not intended to be a placement instrument, uh, but it is intended to provide feedback to the, to the students. and so. One of the most interesting things is that there are a number of factors, including several factors involving non-cognitive characteristics, so things like persistence and time management. <coughs> and those things are, uh, at least for our student population, uh, correlated with, with student performance. So even though it's not intended to be predictive, we've looked at the relationship between these readiness scores and grade outcomes. And, and there are some interesting Relationship. So it's particularly useful for, uh, and I, I think uh, uh, Tamara Hunt gave a nice example at uh, Provost Council of what she has done with it, where she asks the students as an assignment to reflect upon the assessment of the feedback and how they're going to put the feedback into use because Smarter Measure provides some customized feedback for students based on this. And actually, so there are scales that assess readiness, but there's also a uh, learning style assessment. And so they don't, they don't determine readiness based on learning style, but there's clearly a relationship between particular learning styles and uh, ease of taking an online course. So it's good for students, I think, in particular, whether we do anything with it or not. I think at a minimum, I would uh, I'd encourage you to do what Tamara has done, assign students to do a reflection on the assessment, so that shows you that they've read it and they thought about it. And we are going to have a session about master readiness next semester, so I hope to see you there if you are interested to go I have a question, and if each of you would respond, it would be appreciated. Uh, how does your online course compare with the classroom section as far as course completion rates? and student learning outcomes as measured by final grade. To my class, um, one big difference is you will have students drop from online class earlier than the traditional class. Teaching traditional class, I don't have many students drop because they, they don't perform. The online class, yes, they don't have time, they are not disciplined to follow weekly. In terms of grade distribution, I don't see much difference between traditional and online grades. Yeah, I've just taught the online course one up, um, up until now, and for me, I just did one time uh, comparison. 
I've had more students drop in the offline than in the online. Because I don't know whether it's because I, my numbers in the offline are large. You mean percentage of students are larger percentage? No, right? not the numbers. Actually, I didn't do the percentage. I, I, for, I, I, so I taught the online courses once and nobody dropped. And how many students were there? In that Thir class? 30. 30. And in your classroom you have? Anywhere between 200 to 275. That yeah, percentage would be interesting. Mm -hmm. I've only taught this once. Usually a humanities class of mine has 35 students and about 33 will complete with a passing grade. The online class began, it was kept at 25 students, almost immediately five dropped. The most interesting email in that context was, um, am I in the wrong class? I thought this was an online class. Why are we doing so much? <laughs> And then of the remaining, the 2015 completed with a passing grade. So this is unusual for me to have lost that many. The grade distribution was as usual. It's very uneven in humanities classes. They either get it and do well, or they don't do well. And that upside down curve occurred in the online class as well. Any other questions? And I do have something to share about what Susanna just presented. We do have some misconceptions um, about online learning at our student community. And uh, one thing I do have to say, that's why we're bringing the student readiness initiative, including the assessment. And also we offer a one credit elective course called Surviving and Thriving in Distance Learning, because they do need to have some good overview about what this is about and what kind of skills you know they need to acquire in order to be successful in this kind of learning style. So um, you know that is one story actually if you remember Eric from Berner that I worked with him early on and we heard the same comment because and then another comment is that he requires some synchronized meeting. Not required but voluntary and students complain about that too. And I have another complaint from his class. I remember that this one email he printed showing me, he said, uh, the student said, this is the fifth online class I took at USI. You are the first class required to buy a textbook, and why? <laughs> so as you can see at USI, we have some excellent, excellent example for teaching innovations for online education. By the same time, you can see the, the, the quality in terms of delivery varies throughout the, the courses and faculty members. That's why these kind of initiatives hopefully will be, be able to, you know, raise some sort of common vision at our faculty community to really see what online teaching is all about. Only when we are more prepared, you know, we can better prepare our students through the other learning process. So that's really my comment about that. Um, any other questions throughout? Oh, there's more questions. Okay. Very briefly, uh, one example, maybe, Man Fan, uh, you, you've been teaching the longest. How has your course evolved? And then maybe, um, uh, with the others, uh, what's one thing you're going to do differently next time? Uh, and, but before we begin, Man, I have to compliment you that one takeaway point I learned from you is don't respond quickly to email early in the semester. Make an excuse to delay, and then you can impress them at the end. <laughs> Um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the years, I add more and more slides to it because I, you know, from the response from my students, I realized they are questions students didn't know how to solve. There are concepts from the test result they didn't understand. So I went back to add more slides, more explanation, record more. On top of that, I sent an email. I I send email out for the difficult chapters like chapter six and seven. I say there are important concept questions that you have to listen to the lecture in order to get it. So, you know, reinforce they have to listen. Sometimes I have students come back and say, well, you know, I just should follow your slides and I'll be able to pass. But when they get to those chapters, they realize how come there are questions that I don't think I see it anywhere from slides. I said, I emphasize you have to listen to the lecture. So I've been adding more 
Another thing is add more examples with graphs, show them how to solve it step by step. And then on my uh, module, there's one document how it says you have to practice this before you get to homework. So it's just adding more and more stuff to it. Um, I started with didn't like to teach online, but I was told we need to. And now I enjoyed it because you spend so much time, now you can utilize your time better. Yeah, um, as far as I'm concerned, I, I really have not given a thought to how I, I mean, I, I just taught it once, so I do want to, you know, continue to strengthen what I have um, a little bit more before I can think of what else I want to add to it. So based on your one-time experience, you're not going to junk anything on that one experience, really? No, I mean... At least give it a second attempt. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, the, because the thing that I really want to solidify is the voice thread. Right? And um, because that's the one that I really like that the students can talk to each other. And I can see them when they're talking to me. So that is something I want to solidify a little bit more, make it more robust in terms of meeting my course goals. So. Yeah, also, only having taught it once, I will tweak the syllabus, I think, with a, a different kind of synchronous activity. I want to keep it. And then since the syllabus is actually finished now, after it's tweaked a little bit, I will send it sooner so that the students are more aware of the kind of, in, the level of interaction that this course requires so that they can drop and add whatever else they would rather do sooner then that was possible for last time. Would you want to do that as soon as they've registered for the course? Is that too soon? Um, I know the class starts on, I don't know, May 13th or something like this. So I should probably mail something in the middle of April. And they have a whole month to change their plans if they so desire. When I taught summer two and three last summer, one section in summer two, one se section in summer three. So at the beginning of summer two, I sent a course syllabus for summer three. I had a student email back, said, I thought I registered summer three. I said, I know, but I just want you to get a course syllabus knowing what you're going to get into with only four weeks course load. Yeah, I also remember putting, that's a good thing, putting it a much earlier so that they know what's in there and they can prepare for it. And another thing I want to say that showing how prepared you are to your students actually um, foster them to be more prepared for the class. So if we are not prepared, how can we expect our students ready? You know, so that's another another uh, relationship in terms of the outcome I would like to point out. But today, thank you so much for our three presenters. <laughs>